Hello, y'all. Welcome to this session. I'm super excited to have Kevin and Megan Garlington on uh, from Total Tennis Domination. It's so cool to see them here. And they're doing a very high-tech production here. They're they're on high court tech. live, which like we never have, you know, except for I think they were they did this last year too. So they're like pretty much the only people who who do this. So I'm just just really That's grateful great. that they're taking the time to set everything up. Um, so Kevin and Megan, how are y'all doing? We're doing good. Doing great. Especially it was we were actually had like thunderstorms yeah. and different things this morning, and then it kind of passed, and then now, now I got this. Perfect. So it's it's a good day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I prayed pretty uh, pretty hard last night um, <laughs> the weather would be good at your place i said i'll take the storms you guys take the sun and uh, all credit we to appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no problem no problem but um but yeah i uh, i'm excited for this just shout out to a couple people hey alan what's up bruce how are you hey saleh hey jack um nice to see y'all in here so yeah i mean today as you can see on the screen and i'm gonna blow um M megan and kevin up in a second on we're going to be talking about how to hit a penetrating backhand slice. And we have an awesome demonstration coming up for you with two of the best in the business. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll take uh, I'll let you all take it away and then we'll take questions later. OK. Awesome. All right. OK. So we're super excited to be here. We always Mirabon puts on a great event and we just want to thank him for that first. But let's talk about the backhand slice. And so the way we're going to approach the backhand slice might be a little different than usual. But I like doing things a little different sometimes because it might give you a different perspective. This is my lovely wife, Megan, who will probably tell you, <laughs> you don't want to hear his perspective. <laughs> but this is why we work together, because we get to go back and forth and banter about different things. But the very first thing I want anybody to think about for a slice is the contact. And I think the contact is so important. The way I think about the contact is the racket face angle and the racket path. And I apologize, we're hopefully going to do an iPad work, but we had a little technical difficulty. But if you slow mo down or you look at a slow mo um, image or video of someone hitting a slice, it's very interesting because you see very distinct similarities in the contact, meaning the racket face of contact, um, regardless of how they take it back. And this is kind of, I think, one of the, the crazy things is you look at different players and you I actually had a, a video of John McEnroe and Tiafo. And you probably say, how different could their slice be? And you're totally right in the sense of the swing and maybe even how they set up. But when it gets down to contact, it's pretty much the same. And so this is the first area I want to kind of point people in to really focus on what their slice is doing. Because sometimes we get so caught up in the swing and everything else, and we have this gorgeous kind of looking slice that looks like our favorite pro. But the thing is going like up, down, over, and we're not really understanding that racket face. Yeah, I think it's really important when you do analyze video that you really focus on the similarities that you see and not the outliers that you see, especially when you're looking at the pros, because sometimes the outliers are just their type of flair or whatever, rather than the similarities are the things that you want to have in your strokes, especially with backhand slice. Yeah. So really quick demo I want to do. Megan's going to toss me a ball from right here. And I saw this. I want to give credit where credit's due. I saw this on a video and I thought it was great because I, I think I describe it, but he did a phenomenal kind of demo. And I was like, that is so cool, which is Thomas from Field Tennis. I saw him do a demo in a video one day where basically for him, he was talking about topspin. And can you back up a little bit for a second? He was talking about topspin and he was talking about just about the racket face and how it influences the ball. I'm going to do it really quickly here. So notice how with my racket face being closed, if I make contact, look where the ball is going to go. And then if my racket face is open, this is primitive, look where the ball is going to go. It's going to go up. And so I want you to understand where the racket face goes. Basically, it's going to influence where the ball is going to go. It's going to have a very big influence. And so what he was talking about a little bit was creating top spin, okay, with the racket face. And what we're going to talk about is basically the opposite, creating back spin. But the key is making sure that when we're thinking about the contact, that we're not thinking about the racket being open. Because even from my backswing, my racket face is pretty open. And I see a lot of other pros were pretty open. You see sometimes Federer's here. You see different kind of uh, setups. But again, what I really want to emphasize is when we get to contact, this is the most important part. And the other thing I would say about this is that, can I see those? Mm -hmm. This is where you see sometimes what I call some janky slices. <laughs> and what I mean by that is you see some people with some really kind of really funky stuff going on there. And they have these crazy take backs. But what they do understand instinctually, maybe, if not directly, is that I have to get that racket face at contact. So if you run into somebody and they're, they're like winding balls up and then they're like doing crazy stuff to hit the spin, and you're like, oh, that's a horrible slice. But they understand something instinctually. 
that the racket face has to be at the right place. Now, is that the most efficient way of hitting the slice as far as getting the racket to it? No, and that's what we're gonna really share with you and talk to you about how to be more efficient about creating that drive through the slice. Yeah, that's why when you play these people and you get so angry because they look so janky and they beat you because they understand the contact point, it's so frustrating. <laughs> but it really is important to understand, again, those similarities that you're going to see in the contact point and the racket face are really, really important to making the ball go where you want it to go. So now we're going to talk about and break it down. How can we hopefully have a more efficient slice and some key markers that will help us do that? The first thing we're going to start with is the grip. And this is, can be a very, I don't, I don't want to say controversial, but Different people have different opinions. We even have different opinions sometimes. But what I want to stress is more so the grip, at least to me, we'll hear from Megan in a second. The grip for me is about creating stability in the wrist. So when you make contact with the ball, your rack is not going to be doing a lot of crazy things. And I think the probably the biggest two, not controversial, but kind of like people going back and forth is between like a continental grip or sometimes a slight eastern backhand grip. And the difference being with like a continental grip right here, uh, I'll come closer. With a continental grip right here, what it does, it puts the wrist in a slight flexion. I hope I got that right. I always get flexion and extension confused, but flexion means slightly up, meaning your wrist is going to be in a more stable position. And so with a continental grip, it doesn't put your hand in an extreme flex position. So a lot of times players in the beginning have trouble creating that stability with it. And so the, another suggestion is to go to a little bit more eastern backhand grip. Now this, it closes the racket face, but then when I pull my wrist back, it gets that angle that I generally want for my slice, but it's a lot more secure. And so I don't think one or the other is right or wrong. It's personal preference. I personally like to teach and show people the continental grip, but I'm not against showing them the eastern backhand grip if it helps them have a more secure contact. Because again, it's going to come down to when they're swinging, how secure is the contact that they don't feel like they have to wrist it over and do extra things using smaller muscles because we want to use big muscles that are back in. Yeah, I think getting as close to continental as possible. I think there's a lot of people who are actually more towards like an Easter forehand, which makes it very difficult to get the racket position that you want it to be in because then it gets to be in like a pushy slice when your wrist is out. It makes things really difficult to be able to control the racket face. So I think the more continental you can get, the better it is. Um, I don't really go all the way up to the Eastern backhand, <laughs> but uh, definitely I think that continental is where I teach is at most. Yeah, I want to point out one other thing that Megan did when she had like the, the, the other grip, the, I think you said the, the forehand, almost like a forehand grip. Yeah. You see how this puts her wrist in a position where it's kind of what I think of compromise, meaning the wrist muscles have to do a lot of the work. And when that has to happen, you put a lot of stress on your wrist, which makes it difficult to deal with even when the ball's hit hard. Yeah, you can maybe get away with it when there's not a lot of pace on the ball, but if you want a solid biting slice, you're going to want real stability at contact. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And so the next area that we like to think about is taking the racket back. And again, this is a, a totally different ways. We were talking about this morning. I was like, the different styles of taking a racket back um, vary. And again, it feels what's not necessarily feels comfortable to you, but it should feel comfortable. But the main idea is that we're trying to coil our body up and use big muscles to swing. It's very similar to any ground stroke. We want to use big muscles to swing. So what makes, I think, slice a little bit easier is because when you're slicing, we don't have to generate as much pace to hit it, where in the, like a top spin forehand, we have to use our body a lot more. So there's a lot less body when we start our forward swing. But when it comes to take back, generally what I like to focus on is making sure that we prepare our hands with that solid grip and contact. We have a racket coming across the body, and mostly I focus on just turning the shoulders. So it's a unit turn, per se, on the backhand side, and it's not just your hands kind of taking the racket back. And I think this is one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of players make is they see a slice and they just kind of take the racket back. And then it turns into a flicky action where it's just the arm. And sometimes you are put in a position where you're just trying to survive and you just have to get it back. But optimally, if we have some time, if we have a little bit of time, it's, I think, much quicker just to turn your shoulder, which sets this whole deal up where you're going to be a lot stronger. You can use your back muscle, your arms, and everything to take the racket back and it prepares you and coils you for the next stage. Yeah, I think it's really important. I know Kevin takes his racket back a little bit different than I do, but I think it's really important to think about not using the wrist. The wrist is not going like this as you're hitting because then it gets real flicky, flicky. But it's really about using your, you know, I always say like lead with your forearm so that you're pushing forward instead. So you're able to actually use the coil because then people get into this coil and then they just kind of like push the ball. So you've negated actually using the coil to make it efficient at all. So it's all about being able to coil so that you can uncoil and use that through your slice. 
So just want to check in with Mirabon. Are we good? Any questions? Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, let me check. So yeah, we have um, a comment here. So that's question. Gordon, I agree with Megan on the grip. Cut backhand is perhaps most effective on grass for approach shot? Question mark. What about putting the side and fade on the cut backhand? Oh, I like Ooh, that. That's exactly what we're about to head uh, into. Because uh, we're going to start talking about the forward swing in one second. And this is where we even have different styles. And I probably changed my style over time, which is when we start talking about the forward swing, I like to think that there's probably two main, maybe there's more, but two main swings that I tend to see on the slice. One, generally, where you're going through the ball. And this is taught, I was taught as a junior, kind of like taking the racket back here and just turn on your shoulder and pull it through. And I think what you see a lot more, which I kind of do more, is coming across the ball. And so, again, making sure, at least for me, not getting confused about the, the look of it. With each one, we have the same exact racket face, but we have a different type of path, which creates a different type of spin or curve or cut. And that's the, the thing you want to understand. It's like, what do you want? Uh, on a low ball, sometimes when I'm approaching, I will come across the ball and create side spin on purpose to make the ball run away from my opponent and make it more difficult. And then sometimes if a ball is higher, I might penetrate and hit the ball a little bit more through. I'll use both depending on the situations. And I think that's if you can learn to understand both and use both, you'll find that I think certain ones work better in different situations. Yeah, low ball approaching on grass courts cross body all day okay like that yeah. that's the one time that i'm like okay i get that but i very rarely will come across the ball um i'm more of a straight penetrating slice most of the time very yeah. rarely he he definitely his swing path comes across the ball more has a little bit of curve yeah and so with the swing i want to talk about as we just talked about taking it back um, and for me, a lot of times I'm getting the butt of the racket here, but from here, now I'm going to start engaging my hips and then my shoulders to pull the racket down compared to just my elbow. And I think Megan was talking about this before when people, players are using the wrist, they're using small muscles, or even sometimes where they're just using their arm by themselves compared to as you coil up and then you uncoil and you send the racket forward. And when you can do it that way, you have less tension in your arm. And then you're allowed to create the racket face angle that you want based on the ball. Because even though we're talking about a penetrating slice, I think the slice for me is like, it's like going to ice cream shop and you got all these different flavors. You have the biting back, uh, backspin slice. You have the slice that sometimes you need when you're running and you're going to float it a little higher. You have uh, a short slice. I mean, there's so many different varieties of slice. And so I think when you understand the general principles of it, you can select whichever slice you want. And so with us talking about the biting slice, Basically, because we want to create more bite, that means we're going to be going through the ball a little bit more versus maybe across. Um, and it's really important to understand if you understand what kind of slice you want, you can produce it because you understand the racket face and the racket path. Yeah, I think one other thing is the contact point, um, which kind of goes along with like the racket face that we talked about and making mm -hmm. sure that I know a lot of people when they're hitting a slice, they're having trouble because the ball is really sailing on them. And a lot of times it's because they're making contact so far in front that your racket face is really far open. So you need to make sure that you're on the contact point on a slice, especially a biting slice that you want to stay really low to the net. The, the contact point needs to be more towards your chest and then you extend through the contact point rather than having the contact point be at the end of your swing path. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a common error and why a lot of people have trouble with slice or only use the slice when they're like dead on the run and they're barely getting there and then they just barely get it back and they're like, that's my slice. Um, instead of being able to utilize it in different situations like an approach shot or the, yeah. that way the ball stays very low and that way your opponent has to hit up as you're coming forward or when you're in trouble and you need a little bit of time but you don't need, really need to lob. It's a great you know, opportunity to kind of float the ball back deep which um, doesn't allow your opponent to really come in and take it out of the air, but gives you that time that you need to be able to get back into the point as well. So I think being able to understand where that contact point is and um, making sure that your contact point is a lot further back in line with your chest um, and at most like out in front of your uh, shoulder, that once you get in front of your shoulder, things start getting real hard to actually hit a good penetrating slice for sure. Yeah, can you go back and do what, exactly what you did? I think it's really important that we can all feel this at home. If we're making contact out here, where else are you gonna push? There's pretty much nowhere you're at the end of your rope. So what happens a lot of times we make contact up here and to compensate, we start using smaller muscles with the wrist. 
compared to making contact somewhere around here. So now you have options of pushing through the ball and getting that penetration. And this is one of the most important things that Megan's talking about, of how contact's so important, because if we're at the end of our rope when we make contact, we have nowhere else to go. And so being at the end of the rope, um, it puts us in a position where we can't penetrate the ball. And that's really important if you want to really have that strength of using big muscles to be able to penetrate the ball. Okay, so now let's hit a couple balls. Any questions before we start? Uh, we have a bunch of questions, actually. Um, Ooh. I guess, do you okay. want me to hold them or, I, or ask them now? No, go ahead and ask them now because we can maybe incorporate as we go yeah, through what stuff. We're doing, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Appreciate that. So Jamie um, says, my biggest issue is my, is my backhand slice is very inconsistent compared to my slice forehand. Sometimes it is perfect. Sometimes it floats. Sometimes it drops when I wanted a driver, vice versa. Okay. I think a lot of uh, that is contact point. Contact point and play. And racket face. And they're, like Megan's talking about, they are related. So meaning that if I make contact out here, hopefully you can see my racket face right now. It's very what? Yeah. Very open. And then if I make contact, with, let's say, or another mm -hmm. kind of, I think, happen thing that happens is a lot of times we start reaching and then we start flopping the racket over. So we went from using big muscles in our shoulder and our arm and extending through that we started trying to use and start pronating too early. And this becomes a, kind of problematic because now look what I'm doing with my racket face. I think also like, can you go back to the yeah. a good strong position from here? You know, when you're making contact here, you're strongest in this position as well. So you always want to be looking at, are you making contact with the ball in your strongest position? Like back here is not as strong. Out here is not as strong. So in this position puts you in a much stronger position. Ooh, but, strong. Yeah. <laughs> strong <laughs> position. <laughs> to be able to actually make contact, especially with a penetrating slice. So I think a lot of times when you have people who they can't control what's happening to the ball, they just haven't connected the idea of the racket face to how it feels. Yeah. Um, and so every time the racket face is just a little bit different every time that they hit the ball. And so I think actually videoing yourself and watching your racket face or really just focusing in on the racket face alone, even on drop fed balls for a little wow. bit. Like if I were to just actually like drop feet a ball and just focus on the racket face angle and making sure that I'm trying to get that same racket face every time. So I'm watching the height of the ball and trying to see, make sure that the height stays the same over and over and over again. And then you can work on different heights and understanding how, like when I open my racket face a little bit more that the ball is going to fly up a little bit. And so you can kind of start to work on training the feeling with actually what's happening. Because I think a lot of people, you, you're not going to be able to necessarily always see it, but you can see what's happening with the ball and the ball never lies, to be, definitely with the racket face. Yeah, and I think it's really important that uh, the racket face is a feedback mechanism. And we're going to do actually a drill exactly using the ball machine in a second to show you exactly how to hopefully start fine-tuning that feel so it can be consistent. Because you want to take the feel of what you're doing and go, what's the result? And go, is that what I want? Okay, make an adjustment. Oh, is that what I want? Make another adjustment to get there, get to the point where you're, you're at the ball you want. And it's really just, if you keep doing that enough, then you start connecting and creating that association of what's this gonna, what it feels like and what's the result I should get from that feeling. Yeah. Got it, love it, love it. So uh, some more questions streaming in. This is a good one from Gabriella. Any tips on how to start teaching kids to slice? teaching exercises or games would you teach backhand slice before forehand slice and at what point drop shot so multifaceted question Ooh, uh, multi. <laughs> okay um i think definitely if they um feel comfortable with the kind of holding either some sort of continental or eastern grip go ahead and start teaching it for me it doesn't have to be and i think sometimes we see this big thing of like okay you got to teach all this i would start something super small and just, again we're going to start doing a couple of drills where just starting this way and getting the, uh, the child to feel this small little motion of just taking the racket back and coming forward. It doesn't need to be like back from the baseline. Honestly, with a child, I would start really close to net and just have them not even necessarily slice it, but just pull the racket straight forward and just feel this action. See if they can connect on this action first. And then if they connect on this action, then I start pulling down. I think actually one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the, the biggest issues when we hear the word slice, we think like lumberjack. And we're thinking like, okay, I'm going to slice the life out of the ball here. 
And so it makes it really hard. I mean, if you think about, you have this ball coming towards you this way and you're trying to time it going that way. That's really hard. And so what I recommend is like, you don't think necessarily slice. You think almost like where you're penetrating the ball and you start a little bit higher and come down. Just like for the most part, if you're trying to hit a average top spin ball that goes through the court, you don't pull your racket straight up because what are you gonna get? Tons of spin, but no penetration. You pull up and through. And so if you flip it over, we're going down and through versus hack down. So I would start there first simply and then just get them to feel the ball. And I think it's just a lot of reps of small progression. Start really small. And then as they get better, you start helping them incorporate their body a little bit more. Yeah, I think even bump, like just yeah. can they bump back and forth? And, and I think choking up on the grip is a huge That's a really helpful good tip for teaching slice because you can control the racket face a lot better with your hand up here than you can down here as a kid. So I think, um, I mean, we have everyone start up Even here. adults. Even, yeah, even adults. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, any beginner starting with your racket up here when you're learning how to control the rack face because now I don't have as much play in my wrist. It's, it's going to be a lot stronger. Gotcha. Oh, drop shot. Oh, drop oh, yeah, shot. So yeah. here's the, yeah. the, 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 the part about the drop shot. It's pretty much the same thing. Now, what I consider a drop shot, meaning that you wanted to drop low, is that the path of the drop shot is the thing you got to consider. If this is the net, what you want is the ball falling before it gets to the other side of the net. And so what that means is we're going to have a racket face open, but we now have to swing soft. And so, I was asking when do you teach oh, the drop shot? Oh, dude, day three. <laughs> no, so joking. Day three. <laughs> so this, this, this is why my wife is here. And I'm like, dude, did you hear what they're asking? But um, I would honestly like make it say once they have bumps, you slowly progress it. Drop shot might be a little aggressive. I think um, dro- I'm going to jump in. See, this is, this is- um, I think a drop shot probably like is very long down the road for kids. Um, mm. I think that it's... I definitely teach like a slice soft angle um, for juniors. I think that that is much easier and it can and can get the same results, especially in singles at all the way up to higher level. And then once you start getting the feel, like once they can actually hit a soft angle ball off the court, moving their opponent off the court, then you can start working on actual drop shots um, and making them land inside the service box. Like we used to do that drill yeah. that makes yeah. it land inside. But that's my personal Yeah, opinion. this is, yeah. Value. I would tell you, honestly, this is just a rack of face angle and feel. And so once they get a uh, understanding of that, tinker around with it. They'll, a lot of times the kids will tinker around with it. Everybody loves a drop shot. Yeah, so it's like once you hit tennis. a slice What's and the, then. Like mini tennis. That's how they, most of the kids learn how to get feel on the ball. Yeah. Mini tennis is one of the greatest tools, I think, especially for juniors that are competitive, um, in my opinion. Yeah. So yeah, once they get a feel for it, I think it's just let them do it. And But just in general, it's the idea of having a drop earlier than that. So a lot of times I'll ask a kid who's working on their drop shot, can you make the ball hit the tape? Like hit it, come down and hit the tape. They'll miss it or they'll make slight adjustments. And if you can get them to kind of hit the tape and have them swing a little harder, you'll start getting that connection of like, ooh, I open the racket face and hit the tape. So it just depends on where they are. Gotcha, cool. I bet you that Kyrgios Jr. is going to learn to drop shot immediately. Um, yeah. <laughs> day two, for sure. <laughs> day, day, day one. No, <laughs> um, but so maybe a quick question from Gordon. He he asks, backspin presumably is just cut. Is that the same or? I don't know, and maybe Megan knows, but the idea of cut. I mean, I think for me, it's like a slice. It's going to have either backspin or it's going to have a combination of backspin and side spin. And so, like if I'm hitting, if I'm hitting, let's say a regular slice coming through. That's just, and you can see how the ball's curving or is not curving, it's just going straight. Compared to if I come across, you can see some more curve on the ball. And so I don't know if he means like cutting the ball this way or cutting the ball that way. But again, I'm focusing on the racket face. The path of my racket creates the spin. So either one, if you want a little bit more side or a little bit more down, it's up to you. I think, I mean, slice is just backspin, like the ball going backwards. And like you said, you can add a little bit of variation of the ball kind of going backwards and sideways. I think people say, are you cutting the ball? Meaning like, are you getting uh, the back of the ball? Um, And I would say, yeah, that's, that can very well be the case, but I would say there's definite variations in the cut or how much cut you have and depending upon what you want the result to be on your slice. Yeah. Gotcha. Thanks y'all. Let's see, William. So 
how do we prevent the floats? I know you've talked about some of the fundamentals, but like, I guess what, what do you think is the biggest culprit and obviously other side culprits? To the float? I think yeah. it's the same. It's the, the same. racket face. I oh. think it's, it's okay. too far contact, uh, too far in front is a lot of times why I see a float. They don't, uh, the contact point is at the end of the uh, rope, as Kevin says, at the end of the swing path. Um, but I think just understanding the racket face is really important. And doing drills like trying to hit, you know, like I said, like trying to actually hit a floaty ball and then trying to hit a more drivey ball and trying to like, you know, vary those two can really help you to understand how to control the racket face. I think that is the hardest thing in all of tennis, truthfully. Um, but understanding that the ball never lies. And so when I see, like if I'm trying to cut the ball uh, or trying to hit like a driving slice and my ball goes like this, uh, obviously my racket face is definitely too open at contact, whether that means that I'm making, you know, um, contact way too far in front, or it just means at contact, I'm not able to control the rack base. Sorry. Took me out. Trying. Um, that was cut. So. Is that intent? <laughs> There's your. Yeah. <laughs> Come on now. Uh, I can't give away my secrets. Um, so, but understanding that. And then also like, uh, what we talked about with the, the younger juniors or beginners, um, trying to slice a little bit more with your hand up on the grip so that you can really start to see the racket face and feel it and connect it with what you're doing makes a huge difference as well. I think. Yeah. Gotcha. Love it. Thanks y'all. Um, Chris Bixby, love that last name. Uh, Ooh, how do you hit an effective? That's where we live. Oh, seriously. Dang. Yeah. That's the right. name Bixby of the town we live in. <laughs> Oh, that is so funny. I was actually thinking of Chappelle's show, but uh, uh, how do you hit an? <laughs> Sorry, um, nice. how do you hit an effective uh, slice drop shot <laughs> so that it goes See, over the net short, but still tails Oh, away? everybody's everybody's like now you are. Yeah, now I've you opened up in. the can of worms. Yeah. Um, how about we? I think because I think a lot of this we will answer all these questions and we'll do some drills. And we can maybe come back around and do the rest of the questions because I think a lot of the the questions are coming from racket face. How do we hit the drop shot? How do we penetrate the ball? And a lot of the drills or the the couple of drills will show you that'll really help you train to do any one you want. And so, how about we do some of those drills? Yeah. Uh, I'll show you kind of like what we're talking about. Okay, so the very first drill is just really getting comfortable with using your body. And right, what I mean by that is turning and then turning forward. So when I, you can see how right here, I'm using my hips. And so I'm not even taking my racket back that far. So what I'm gonna have the ball machine basically do is turn, or feed, the ball machine's not gonna turn. I'm gonna turn <laughs> and I'm gonna hit the ball with my racket face very kind of square. Okay, and I'm not gonna hit that hard. So the ball's gonna probably go in the net. Let's see where we are. So I'm gonna go here. And you can see how the ball's not going that far. But the, oh, that, there's your drop shot. <laughs> so the ball's, if I close it some more, it's gonna go low. And so as I slowly start opening up, the ball is going to go higher and I'm going to open up my racket face a little bit more. The ball is going to go higher. And if I open up a lot more, it's going to go really high. And so that's the first thing to understand uh, and just get used to. As I'm turning, I'm opening up my racket face to different degrees. So if we understand that, we can answer a lot of these questions about how do I hit a drive? Well, if I had, let's say that I think it's the first or second racket face, I'll do it again where the ball's going over the net probably by that much. If I turn more and add more pace to that, you can see how now the ball goes deeper and pretty much the same height over the net. So my racket face opened there a little bit, okay? Now, if we're talking about I want a drop shot, ooh, I'm on, I'm, I'm on the hook for a drop shot. If we want a drop shot, what I need to do is make sure, like we were talking about before, that the racket or the ball is, the flight is coming down before uh, it goes to the other side of the net. So if we look at the combination of things we need to happen is that, A, we don't need a lot of a pace. Like I started swinging more to get the driving one. What we need is to open the racket face and be softer. So I'm gonna go through a sequence of, I'm gonna be softer. Okay, you can see how now my racket face is a lot open or a lot more open and I'm hitting the drop shot just because I understand, ooh, maybe that mm, one went a little higher. Crispy. Oh, there we go. Mm. Oh, make nice. sure the ball machine is off. <laughs> <laughs> so through this drill, you can see how basically kind of the elements that because I'm turning, this provides the power, the, the, the force or the cut or the power going through the ball. From there, I'm just directing it. 
So if you have the question of like, why is my slice inconsistent? This was one of the big questions. Is it my rack of faces inconsistent? And so what you need to go out there to do is just start experimenting with feeling the same rack of face. Noticing that when I swing, I'm not flipping over anything. I'm just pulling it through and there's a slight um, shoulder drop to help this. And there's a little bit of pronation, but nothing dramatic. Once I get a feel for the rack of face I want, then I can just either take off power and open the rack of face or put on power and close the rack of face. It's the combination of the two that's going to get you the type of slice you want. Anything else to that? Yeah. No, I think, you know, I mean, obviously when Kevin was trying to drive the ball, there was a big, you know, big coil and a big uncoil. And then when he's trying to drop it short with a lot more finesse, it was a little softer on the coil and a little softer on the uncoil. So I think it's, uh, it, that also can play a part. If you're doing one where you're like really hacking at it and then the next one you're like kind of pushing it, they're gonna be very inconsistent as well, especially if you're trying to drop shot. I think one more thing to say about this is understanding, uh, 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 who was it? Maybe it was Peter Duhan who talked about this, but he said, uh, power and slice don't mix. Oh, yeah, it was Peter. Um, and because what he was saying, Peter's like a phenomenal player. Is if you ever look at Tennis Magazine, he's yeah. always the number one upset. He beat Boris Becker at Wimbledon. We had a cute, cool opportunity to work with him. He was number one in the world doubles, but in a phenomenal slice. Yes. And what he's saying that, that when you start, if you think about what topspin does, topspin creates pressure, which brings the ball down. Well, the opposite of that is pressure bringing the ball up below the ball. And so... The problem is when we start thinking about, oh, I want to hit a, a, a biting slice sometimes, we think in a lot of spin. You, I don't want to cut yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, we started thinking in a lot of spin. So we started saying, I need to really like carve the ball. And what happens is like we get that. We get one that's like great. And then we get one that hits the fence because it's really hard to control the rack face when we have power. And also it's not forgiving. One thing that's nice about a slice is that if you hit it, depending on how you want it, see how long it stays in the air. Sorry, can you toss me one mm -hmm. more ball? Or sorry, two more balls. So if we look at that last one, how long it stayed in air, where if I hit a topspin ball, you can see it diving down. And so if we add power to a ball that's already floating, it's a recipe for disaster. And so what he was saying is that you, want, you don't need to hit the ball that hard. When I hit a biting slice, I have probably in my mind per se, almost like 90% penetration and 10% uh, um, spin. So I'm really focusing on just really that's not me hacking down on the ball. That's really me getting behind and making sure the racket face is right. And I'm adding just a little bit of spin to make sure it skids through the court. And so I think that's really, really important because I think a lot of times we get in this mode, it's like, I want this biting slice. And we start like lumberjacking it and we get one and then one's gone. And, one, and it's, it's just really hard to be consistent. It's very hard to control any racket face angle when you're trying to do that, when you're trying to hit anything really hard. It's just like any other thing in tennis when you try to hit the forehand really hard and it works against you. Yeah. Uh, same type of deal. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> great stuff. Uh, just, yeah, such great teaching here. I really appreciate it. Um, let's see. I'm going to skip around a little bit with uh, questions, but I'll try to get to everyone. Sure. So Alan, cool. So Alan says, can you visualize knifing the ball for depth and skid? <laughs> I like the, the second part, skid. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I visualize uh, isn't the depth, but I visualize the height. Yeah. And so, Al, when I'm hitting a slice, I'm thinking about, like, in my mind, I see a window. And each one of those windows represents different levels of, of depth. Now, also, I have to, I, I, I feel how hard I'm going to hit it. So, like, if I want a ball to go deeper, I know at that pace, if I hit the ball that high, it's going to go deep. Now, Alan, you're talking about the skid. If I want a little bit more skid, actually, what I feel like is I'm going to penetrate the ball a little bit with more, uh, penetrate more and slice a little bit less because I want this ball to really skid through the court. And even there, you can see how I'm not hacking down the ball. I'm not doing this where the ball flies. It looks great, maybe, but I'm really penetrating the ball a lot more, which means I might turn my shoulders. Oh, there we go. That's the skidder. And so I'm really focusing on hitting the ball. It's just like uh, maybe if you've ever played against somebody hits the ball really flat. For me, that's absolutely annoying. <laughs> somebody really good that hits, sorry, my wife hits the ball really flat. Megan be. hits the ball super flat. Mm -hmm. And so the ball, if you notice when you're playing against somebody hits the ball super flat, it skids. It's the weirdest thing where you're like, oh, they hit the ball super flat. And it's like, oh shoot, that, that got them a lot quicker. And so you just want to add a little backspin to that instead of exaggerating the downward cut too much. 
I think that's probably one of the biggest problems that people have with a backhand slice. I mean, is they try to like really cut the ball. It's like super, and it's so hard to control it that way. So you're going to get one that's like amazing. And then you're like five. That are that's everywhere. the problem, really. Huh? That's the problem. You hit one amazing, your brain goes, yeah, and then you're like, that's, that's it. it. I'm going to do it just like yeah. that. And then you can't, you can't actually control it. I mean, it's not about like how fast and how hard you're hitting the slice. It's a finesse shot. I mean, and I think it's really important to kind of remember that, you know, slice, even if you're driving through is much more of a finesse shot and um, mm -hmm. thinking of it that way when you're making contact. And just making sure you understand the purpose of what you're trying to do with the slice. Yeah. Is it that you're trying to mix up the pace? Because if you're going to hit a probably more of a hard biting slice, it probably will come fast and be similar to whatever shot if you're hitting a normal topspin compared to if you're hitting the ball fast topspin and you hit a slow slice, that might be more effective. And so it's really understanding the purpose. Or are you hitting a defensive slice? Or are you hitting a short slice? What's the purpose of why you're hitting that slice versus just, I'm going to hit a slice? Yeah, love that. Love that. Um, and yeah, there was a question. I'm trying to find it here that I think you just answered, but just to cover it. So how much of the slice is yeah. finesse or raw power? So you'd say like finesse. I'm more on that side, right? I'm on the finesse side. It's, yeah, it's sure. raw power tends to make the ball fly. It's really hard to, um, super inconsistent, super inconsistent. Yeah. 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 Like I gotcha. said, you might make one that's really great yeah. and then the next. Five yeah. Like even playing day. against the guy we were talking about Peter before I played against him and yes. he never hit a ball hard, but they were always deep And his slice. It was like, it would touch the, the, the court and just like roll. Yeah. And it was the slowest thing. So it's like really deceiving. You see it coming. You're like, okay. And the next thing you're like, you're on your knees, like with a shovel, trying to get it out of the court. <laughs> it's not allowed, Kevin. You can't play with shovel. No, I'm kidding. Um, well, actually, that, that is true. But um, let's see. Frank, uh, I get more side cut with the grip more towards the eastern backhand and more drive through the court with the continental. Is there something to this or just my peccadillo? <laughs> I'm not sure peccadillo. <laughs> I think, I think yeah, de I think definitely because it puts you your racket face in a different angle. Yeah, like it could it, be like if how I'm you're here, preparing. then my racket face, I'm not able to open my racket faces up as much. So when I make contact, I'm coming at a different angle. So it's going to be mm. uh, across the ball more to be able to get the ball to go over the net compared to continental. I can really push forward still more, and I'm going to be able to same spin. So I think definitely if you didn't change your racket. Like if you did not change your swing path at all and just your grip, your racket face is definitely going to be different from those two grips. No, yeah, the grip is going to change it, and yeah. you might it might feel comfortable in your setup because definitely if you go to more of an eastern grip, your setup's going to be more directed this way. So if you come around, you're going to probably feel if I go straight, you might not potentially get to the ball, so you might be coming across. Mm -hmm. Where with the continental, generally you see the racket face open, which is going to make pu maybe push you through. So there's a bunch of different things that happen. I don't think. Let's say one is either kind of good or bad. It's just making sure, again, coming back to that purpose, you know, sometimes I hit an approach shot and I'll hit it with side spin yeah. because I want the ball to run from the person who's chasing the ball as I'm putting pressure on. Yeah. Uh, or sometimes I might kind of go through it more if I want to keep them deep and maybe push them back. So it just depends on what you want on the purpose. But I think you can create both types of spins with, yeah. with either grip. Um, it just is a little bit slight different, but if you don't change the swing path and just change the grip, I think it also, it kind of does the same thing yeah. for him. Uh, well, yeah, most likely. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks y'all. Um, interesting question here. What about a two handed backhand slice thoughts? Ooh. Oh. Okay. So two minute <laughs> backhand slice. I know that we both get yeah. excited. Well, we actually, Ooh. I used to teach a girl who we, I didn't teach a two handed full two handed. Two to one. I taught a two to one. Yeah. So I think oh. uh, a lot of people who, especially when they're younger, like females, um, don't feel strong enough to have a full one handed slice. And so I would teach a two to one a lot. And so you would start with a two handed in the same position comes to contact and then from contact release with both hands mm -hmm. going out in the same direction. Um, and we actually taught with a guy who did this yeah. 
<laughs> even uh, and and was a, a high level player yeah. um and he did this through his whole career but i think it's really it helps kind of lead the racket in the right direction for someone who doesn't feel like they're they're having a lot of c control issues um when they've you know tried to train it by even taking their hand up and all kinds of stuff they're just not feeling strong enough and so i'll teach a two to one uh, uh, often yeah and for the two-handed uh back end for me, it's, it's pretty much the same. I mean, the only difference is your zone of making contact is now shorter because you have less length in your arms. So I mean, like where I could make me do the contact here and go here, that really kind of stresses out my, my left arm. And so what you have to do generally is wait a little bit longer. That's true. Maybe, maybe we'll. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah, you can see how this is just nasty and not pretty at all, but I'm too far in front. So I'm gonna have to wait a little bit longer, open the racket face. You can see how I can kind of get the feel for it. But for me, I have to really, there we go. We're going to stop there before it gets uglier. But <laughs> I have to really wait for the ball to come back to, to make that contact. My first couple are too far ahead. And so if you can wait a little bit longer so you can feel yourself pushing through the ball, it, it's still, you can still do it. Yeah. And again, like where is your contact point the strongest, yeah. you know? And so, um, you know, two hand, a backhand, your contact point is actually a little bit further back yeah. anyways. And so it's the same thing with the slice. Um, if you have a two handed, it's a little bit further back as well. Yeah. Cool. Very cool insights. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see here. David O'Neill. The problem I have sometimes if the ball is coming cross court and I slice with the racket face back cross, it will go out down the line instead of going cross court. Ooh, so this is where I'm going to say this. Oh, and I'm, the, yeah. Okay, sorry, so, you, so he's going across his body this way, and instead of going back cross court, it's going that way. Okay, so this is, David, nothing personal. The ball never lies. <laughs> it just, it can't, it can't tell a lie. And what I mean by that is the racket face. And so if, let's say, I'm going to swing across my body, and get one to go cross because at contact my strings are looking cross if i swing across my body and i can get it go down the line because i know that my racket face is facing down the line so if you find yourself uh on the, the the thing of like i'm aiming cross court but the ball's going down the line you listen to what the ball's saying and the ball's saying you need to if you wanted to go cross court you need to make sure you swing early enough to make sure the racket face can go cross court uh, it's just wherever you are even though it feels like you may be here it may be here and so a lot of times you know with students we both had where you're going they're like oh I'm, I'm aiming here and the ball's going there it's like okay then aim completely the other way and so what that aim would mean yeah <laughs> seriously and so if you're going i'm going and this is going down the line i would say honestly make your aim like megan's saying <laughs> hopefully you can see that on the other court and what's going to probably happen is you're going to probably find yourself right there and so you now have to cr change your association of what the racket face feels like to you because the ball is telling you your, your, uh, your measurement of it is off and you need to readjust it. So now you get used to going, Ooh, this is what it, it feels weird to me, but this is what the ball is saying is right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Love that. Um, let's see. We got, still got a bunch here. <laughs> uh, Jamie, I actually feel like I get, jammed and am too close to contact more often than i make uh, contact too far out so um what's the solution there well it might be in your preparation yeah yeah that's a, that's that distance in the preparation is huge because if you're preparing with your elbow in here then you're gonna make contact really close to your body i think it's really important to prepare with your racket away from your body so that way when you pull across or pull forward with your arm and your body that you're getting a good distance of where you're making contact. A lot of times when you're making contact too close to your body, your elbow is starting in a really, really bent position. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's very similar to on the forehand. You see a lot of players using their left hand to help with the spacing mm -hmm. while on the uh, backhand slice, this kind of the same idea with the left hand being all the way out. So like Megan's talking about, avoid preparing in here. See if you're in a good ready position with your racket in front. From here, if I just turn, you can see how I have a lot of length here. And you do see players bend, but generally when you see them bend, when they start going forward, the racket or the arm extends, and then you still have that same line. You don't generally see this action. They complete it by turning their shoulder and extending their arm as they're making contact. And so a lot of times that preparation of making sure that when you see that slice, get the racket away from your body. Sometimes I, I pretend like it's a waiter's tray. And you have it out here, and you're waiting for the ball, and then you grab 
and, and swing. Not in a real match because that would be hard. But if you're practicing, <laughs> practice with it out here, boom, and then you can swing. She loves me. Okay. Mm. <laughs> I could tell. <laughs> uh, let's see. It's deep. It's real deep. <laughs> Yeah, I love to hear it. Love to hear it. He, he deserves it. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, okay, Alan, could saying knifing the ball will give us the desired result? Is that the proper terminology? Result. I mean, it, I, people I will say like a penetrating slice is like knifing. The yeah, ball. I, I think, think it's kind of like slang the same thing. The slang, but I, I mean, whether you want to really believe that you're, you're, I mean, just make sure that you understand the distinction of you're not actually knifing the ball, you know, that you're um, still looking at it as a finesse shot and going through the ball and penetrating the ball through contact rather than yeah, and knifing I, it. For me, like whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. But as long as the association to the shot you want is what you're calling it. Mm -hmm. So if you're calling it knifing and it's going through the court and it's penetrating, Keep knifing it up. Uh, penetrating, same thing. Finessing. It's just making sure you understand the mechanics of how it works so you can produce the knifing slice or whatever kind of slice you want. I think yeah. it's what's really important. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Uh, let's see here. Alan, can, can you please discuss the technique differences between the slice and a chip? Ooh, the chip. So, like, I'm assuming he means, like, chip sure. on a serve. Yeah. Uh, shorter. Uh, one of the biggest things is where I'm assuming he's talking about a serve. And so the difference now is that you have a ball that has a lot of speed on it. And so what you really want to focus on is in this sense, using your body weight. So if the ball comes really fast, I'm going to use my legs, small turn and exact same thing. And so what I mean by the exact same thing is I'm focusing on my racket face. What you tend to see when players are chipping or sorry, what you don't tend to see when players are chipping is a big swing because generally the ball's already gone and then they're trying to catch up. You'll see a much shorter swing. And I think the biggest difference is you won't see a ton of rotation this way, but you'll see more of them pushing with their outside leg. So kind of like a volley. Yeah, kind of like a volley. I would say if I'm here, I this is not it's the like best accurate. Yeah, I'm going to scoot up, but I'm just going to go here. And you can see how I'm really not taking a... traditional slice swing there i'm making it really short and i'm pushing my weight through the ball and so that push and that racket face it's what's going to be important compared to taking a big swing possibly catching the racket really open sending the ball in a lot of different directions yeah. gotcha good stuff good stuff um let's see i had a kind of a funny one oh yeah so they said uh sorry alan says so megan and kevin are no longer in milwaukee uh so where are you all at right now just to let everyone know we live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's right. That's right. And then Alan says they are both looking good, slimmer than when they were with Essential Tennis with Ian. <laughs> so he must have been it's making warm. you all work at the desk too much. I guess. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. text Ian and tell yeah. him that. <laughs> yeah, I will do. Um, sorry, mm -hmm. I thought that was funny. Let me see what yes. else we got. No, it's a good one. Yeah. No, it's just great to hear. Um, Chris, are there any balls you should not be trying to hit a slice off of? I personally don't think there's not particular a ball you're not supposed to hit a slice off of. It's more so what's the purpose? Yeah. You know, um, what are you trying to do? Uh, for me, if you're not going to hit a slice, the reason not to hit a slice is because you don't have a purpose. And so you're just arbitrarily like, oh, I'm just going to slice it for no reason. I think it's just really making sure that what are you trying to do? Are you trying to hit a slice because you're trying to kind of toy with the, the timing? Are you trying to hit a slice because you're trying to buy time? Are you trying to hit a slice and change directions maybe and it's easier? Uh, it's just understanding that purpose. So I don't think there's really a, a ball you can't, I'm trying to really think through this. It's not a ball that I, I really think you can not hit a slice on. No, I think, I, yeah, I think it's all about purpose, right? If the ball is directly in your strike zone, where you could hit a backhand and you're slicing for a reason. Yeah. yeah. But if you're not slicing for a reason and you're just slicing the slice, you know, then you probably need to evaluate like, what's your strategy? Are you trying yeah. to slow the ball down? Are you trying to change the, the pace? Are you trying to change the spin? Are you trying to keep the ball low? Or do you need defensive? Do you need time? Because understanding that obviously top spin is going to get to your opponent a lot faster than a slice is. And so strategically, you need to be able to hit a slice because you want that time or 
your opponent has trouble with the change of pace because it is a slower ball. Mm. Um, so just being strategic or even like about bring them to net or something. I mean, right? Like yeah, short, but there's or, a reason or an angle slice, yeah. those types of deals. Yeah, but there's a reason. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Good stuff. Um, let's see here, Alan, Kevin, side or, and Megan, Kevin or sorry. <laughs> I'm jumbling my words here. Um, side spin on slice is dependent on the height of the ball you're hitting. Can you put side spin on slice if the ball is above my shoulder? Maybe a reverse side spin slice. <laughs> you can, uh, you can, can side spin on any can, ball. Yeah. It's the side spin comes from the racket, the way that the racket goes through the contact point that's how side spin is created so you, you can technically put it on whatever ball you want yeah i do think hitting a, a kind of a higher ball with sli uh, side spin is a little it's bit hard. more difficult yeah. more like uh hitting in your strike zone just i think for me and just watching players if you're here this is kind of the natural path of your arm like if i just relax here and let the kind of go back and forth so most of the side spin here I could do it up here, but you can see how it probably stays with the ball a little bit more. So if you want to exaggerate it slice, it's going to probably be in your strike zone. I uh, actually like the the side slice on the lower balls. Yeah, that's on the lower I, ball. When it's know. really low and I'm coming forward, that's when I'll side, you know, side mm -hmm. slice it. Um, if it's in my strike zone, I usually just – I'm going forward. I'm not actually side slicing. No. I'm, I mean, up high, I'm definitely not. But technically – like to answer the question, you could hit side slice on any ball you want. Yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. the direction of the swing path through the ball. Sometimes it's hard on the high ball. I mean, that's yeah. de definitely that's difficult. Megan hit the high ball. No, so. it's <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hit side slice on the high ball, but it's definitely <laughs> difficult. But it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> Anything's possible. Another thing, yeah. I, here's the other thing. I'll, I'll come back to it. It's purpose. So for me, mm -hmm. I wouldn't try to hit a knifing side spin slice from here because more than likely if I'm hitting it above my shoulders, I'm in trouble. Yeah. And so because I'm in trouble, I'm gonna try to buy time. Maybe if my, I know my opponent's coming in or something, but even then I'm gonna buy time with probably a high Just floaty slice. Back, and so yeah. it's, again, it comes back to the idea of like the situation you're in, reading that and then responding with something that makes sense based on the situation you're in. Perfect, yeah, definitely agree with that. Uh, let's see, Alan, how about leaning into the shot and reducing your shoulder turn? Hmm. Leaning in. Um, I mean, I do lean in sometimes. I don't think that's not a, a, a bad thing, but I would probably still do my shoulder turn yeah. because my shoulders and my hips are going to, what's going to start initiating the swing. If I'm in a lot of trouble, maybe, and I don't have time, like if I'm hitting a slice off my back foot, then I'm going to kind of default to maybe just now I don't have an, the same level of shoulder yeah, turn. You just use your arm. Yeah. Kind of like two in a backhand. You'll see those guys like just flick the ball sometimes when they're out of position. Yeah. Uh, I mean, definitely you can just kind of push the ball. But is it the best slice? Probably not. Is it the most efficient? Definitely not. Yeah, yeah. You have different kind of ways of looking at like at top efficiency. I want to be using my body to, to really lean in and uh, drive my weight and rotate. And then you go to the next level where I'm just literally trying to like, okay, I'm in trouble. I might just use my arm very little. And then it's just like, I'm survival mode. It's just get the ball in at all means necessary. But so you it, have to look at that. But though, I mean, you can't, you definitely would rather have your shoulder be a little bit down than trying to slice with your shoulder up. Too. Oh yeah. Like that's definitely difficult. So, so yes, I mean, you can't. It, it, no, no, I'm agreeing with that. Yeah. But, um, but it's not the most efficient way for sure, because then you're just arming it. If you have zero coil, then you have zero body movement through the ball. So you're just going to rely on smaller muscles. It's, it can be done. It's just not the most efficient way. And honestly, here's the other thing thinking about it. The coil is what's going to prepare me. Mm -hmm. And so the fact of like hitting a slice like that, I can't even imagine that. Like even if the ball comes to my body, mm -hmm. I'm moving and I've already made this, this turn. And so this is what's preparing. And so making sure that you understand that the coil is the preparation. And so I can uncoil regardless of the time I have, I'm going to be coiling to hopefully give myself an opportunity to uncoil. I think what he's saying is that you coil and then you lean and then you do this yeah. instead of coil and then you extend out through the ball. Okay. Um, I don't know. Oh. Just, uh, yeah, no, that's good stuff there. And uh, sorry, I should have checked with you all about timing because I know it's, you know, it's one thirty right now. I so, I mean, do you... we're okay for a little okay. bit. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate. It. Yeah. Just let me know when, when you all have to go. Um. But yeah. Great. Great. It's just it's so interesting how many questions we're getting. Uh. Which is awesome. So, uh, <laughs> on, on one stroke. 
Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, Gordon, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what 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 a uh, point of ball do you aim for to get cut, and what point for slice slash underspin? Oof, three different terms. Mm. <laughs> I think they they all mean the same thing in my yeah. terminology. Slice slash uh, underspin because yeah. slice that, that, is underspin, yeah, cut is, is slice. Side? Okay. Which is I, underspin. I feel like you're, you, this is like one of those like little things where you open like up the thing and there's another yeah, one in there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I would say this, <laughs> yeah. to, to clear the, the, or kind of narrow down the definitions, I look at maybe what you're describing as cut as penetration. And then a normal slice is just kind of a normal slice. And so both of them have the same characteristics in the sense that they have underspin. It's just the level at which I'm penetrating the ball versus not penetrating. So if I really want to penetrate that's going to be a penetrating slice. If I really want to, let's say, just hit a normal slice. Yeah. So the only difference is the flight and the trajectory. So when I say, when I think of cutting uh, or penetrating, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking the, 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 the trajectory is very direct, very like, I'm going to cut you. And then when I think of like slice, it has a more curve. <laughs> I'd add that in there. Uh, I'm a little scared right now. Were you directing yeah. that? <laughs> every day of my life, everyone, every day. Oh, man, I love it, man. I love it. I'm so sad that I missed you in Tampa. Oh, man. I know. Yeah, We're going to have to, yeah, next time. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I can't wait. Um, uh, let's see. So, Frank, when Brady of DTL teaches the knifing slice, shout out to Brady, um, he really Brady. dips his front shoulder. <laughs> Uh, Kevin hits a very nice penetrating slice without the exaggerated front shoulder dip. What's the difference? I think it's personal preference, and this is why I think us starting with the racket face was so important for us. Because, again, you're going to see Brady could be dipping a shoulder, and if you watch it, the relationship of that dip to the racket face. And sometimes, depending on, like, if I don't have a very low ball where I need to maybe dip my shoulder... I'll just adjust it with just a slight adjustment here. And so, because depending on the situation, if the ball's higher per se, I'm not gonna necessarily be able to dip my shoulder on a particular ball. So I don't think it's either one's right or wrong, but I think what you gotta understand is the racket face. I mean, again, like what we were talking about, and we've all seen it on TV, let's say a pro's just doing whatever they can to get the ball back. But when you look at the contact, you see the racket face. And so whether you dip it, whether you like do it like I'm doing it, or like how Megan's doing it, or you like even like Nadal full splits, I haven't seen that one yet. But uh, like you see Nadal, Nadal has a very, I, very distinct slice where I feel like he comes across. Um, you see all these different flavors of it. But again, when you slow it down and you look at the contact point, it comes down to contact point, path, depending on how much spin or penetration you want and what's powering that with yeah. the body. And yeah. so those are the things where we could always look at so many different slices and different, even different grips. I think I want to say, I'm going to go on a limb here. The doll is a little bit past continental, but on the opposite side, more almost it feels like he's on like a, uh, not an Eastern forehand, but something. Yeah. And he really just nice it across. And so, it's not to look at Nadal and say that's the ideal of Federer, that's the ideal. But like Megan was talking about, those commonalities with the racket face, and they all they're all turning their shoulders to provide power to the the contact. Mm. Good stuff, good stuff. Appreciate it. Um, I randomly really rem uh, remember that there was a drink called Slice. You remember that the soda? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah, yeah. Was that in the it's orange? Like lemon lime or, or something? Oh yeah, Slice. I think it might have been lemon lime. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'm she's so right. Remember. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, uh, back to it, Gordon. On a red clay court with high bounce, is backspin more effective than topspin? Hmm. I don't, Depends on who you're playing. Yeah, and I don't think it's yeah. it's not. Again, it comes about the purpose. I think the clay will exaggerate spins. Yeah, that's the the beautiful thing about playing on like a red clay and even I guess a green clay. It's not really like mm -hmm. as slow, but um, the clay is just going to exaggerate spins. Just why. You look at some, like if you, if you played on clay, I played in Spain, and everybody hits such a heavy ball because it just exaggerates the spin. And then when they come out with a slice, it's like, whoa. And so the clay just exaggerates what you're doing. And so, again, what the Mega's saying is like the purpose. It's like, will that exaggeration create a short ball or create an error from your opponent? It's slice, uh, you know, versus Thompson. 
Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, let's take a couple more and then definitely want to let the viewers know about um, where they can uh, find all of uh, Megan and Kevin's awesome content. Um, let's see here. John, uh, do you keep your wrist locked through impact and follow through? It seems like when I'm losing control, it's because I'm getting too wristy or am I mistaken? It's pretty close to locked. It's, it's pretty not close to locked, but it's not locked. But, um, hmm. but yeah, I mean, you're definitely keeping it along the same path. But I think locked is a very uh, harsh term in the sense that that means like hmm. all the way through, you never yeah. change it. So I think, uh, you know, you want it to be softly stay around the same position. Oh, softly stay around. So. I almost think about like if you take your hand, and if I have these two fingers out, just about that much of movement. I'm not doing uh, full, I think that's like ulnar deviation or something, um, but just a little bit. So when I'm hitting, I do want a pretty solid contact here, and but there is some play because there's... Um, People always murder me on the internet for this, but momentum or inertia of the racket moving forward. And so, all you, the terms. yeah, it's all the terms. All right. But right you, the, because the racket head has built up some speed and has some weight, you're going to want to release that a little bit, but you don't want to get where you're wristy. Yeah. So, you see now where I have almost like the straight line here. I keep pretty much a, a pretty decent L shape, or not L shape, this would be L, but somewhere around here through my slice. So, I have a little room to play and feel the ball. But it's not locked off where now it's you, you have all this energy and now it's like, what do you do with yeah. it? Mm, mm, love it. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is a really good one, actually. Um, Jamie, I didn't mean to say actually like the others weren't, though. They're all good questions. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Jamie, what footwork do you teach for the slice? <laughs> I know there are different. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, footwork for a slice. I mean, you, you generally at least I think for any stroke, you want to think of transitioning your weight forward. And so I have where my back foot generally starts um, loading the weight, and then I shift my weight forward. That's one uh, potential footwork you have. If you're going to be approaching, I'm going to do the same thing. But now because I'm approaching and I want to keep my shoulder sideways a little longer, I'll do a cross behind. Um, you can end an open slice when you're in trouble. But again, here, my outside leg is going to be a part of it. So if you're just a general slice, You'll see that I'm loading my weight, okay, loading my weight, okay, and then maybe if I'm running, oh, sorry, I guess this will be a good one. If I'm running, what will happen is the difference between me loading my weight and coming forward or loading my weight there, I would run and bring the foot around. And so I don't know if I'm still on camera, but if I'm running for the yeah. ball, I'm going here if I was really running. And you can see how I transfer my weight sideways. That way First, you can get the full un uncoil. Yeah. As well. Mm -hmm. So it just that's just kind of dissipating the energy. Because if I'm running this way, I have a lot of momentum going this way. And I want to make sure I can keep my balance through the contact. If I'm not, then a lot of times I'll just hit and bring it around. Mm -hmm. and so the biggest thing with the footwork is to keep your balance and that you can have uh, some level of rotation. Be careful about over rotating, but make sure you do have some level of rotation. Or early rotation. I see people like they're like, okay, I'm gonna make my foot come around, yeah. and then um, you know that's mm -hmm. not what you want either. You want it to naturally like you hit, and then it's coming around to help you uh, balance to be able to actually go back. Awesome. Yeah. Great point. So last question here. Uh, John, do you stare at the contact point like Federer rather than look up Ooh, at the stare. target to see the racket face angle? <laughs> I personally don't think I stare. I should probably because it's a great... I was just going to say, we all probably should. <laughs> it's a great kind yeah. of tool to just make sure you're not looking up too early. Um, but I, I know I look down a lot, but I don't, it's not the full stare, Federer yeah. stare, but definitely that's something that if somebody's having an issue where they're hitting some mishits, I'll have them yeah. stay, keep their head down because a lot of times if we do move our head, it moves a lot of the racket. And so we don't want that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. Most definitely. Well, I mean, we're getting a lot of great comments here from peeps. Um, Alan, thanks for the tutorial. Um, great discussion. Um, yeah. People awesome. are really liking it. So really appreciate that. Awesome. Uh, just want to obviously like educate the audience about you all uh, in terms of like, I guess, you know, where they can, you know, check out your content or I don't know, take lessons for, you know, whatever it is that, that you might want to let the audience know about. Well, you can always reach us at total tennis domination.org or check out our YouTube channel, total tennis domination. We do do in-person stuff here in uh, Oklahoma. So you can just um, go to the website and just 
fill out a support ticket and we'll get back with you and set up dates because we've, we've been doing that. It's been a lot of fun having people come to Oklahoma. Uh, but yeah, you can get content YouTube, our website, get on our mailing list because uh, we send out weekly uh, things on different things. Like we were just doing something on footwork uh, for the forehand on our last week's conversation. So yeah, you can reach us there. Awesome. Awesome. And yeah, and we do have um, links below the video and yeah, I mean, I, I can't uh, recommend Megan and, and Kevin highly enough. I mean, they do a lot of awesome work. Um, you know, I, I, I it's just funny. I, I've followed you all for a while. I mean, obviously, you know, before you were at essential tennis, uh, you know, doing your thing and then you went to essential tennis for, I guess, a few years and then now yeah. you all are on your own again. So it's definitely a fun journey seeing y'all do, do your thing. I also have included here, um the all access pass link uh for kevin and megan if you want to support them and i think you should and get the all access pass so you can check out this amazing lesson you know anytime you want in the future so just put that in there but yeah um i guess are there any uh any last thoughts about the backhand slice whether it's just keys or just you know things to take in mind uh for for next action steps um i think for the most part, just keep it simple. I think when you break it down, at least I think that doesn't mean everybody else thinks. When you break it down, you focus on the simple kind of parts that make the biggest difference. You can start adjusting and making bigger corrections in the right direction. A lot of times I think just so many students, obviously we hear different things, we have different ways of doing it, but if you can find those core things that really make a difference, it'll really make a difference in how consistent you can be and how much easier it is to figure out what you need to do to get it better. Yeah, definitely. I think that's uh, it's finding the commonalities. Um, you know, like you said, every every coach, including us, yeah. talks very differently on specific things, but the core fundamentals are the same. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Appreciate it. And um, yeah, let's see. Frank says thanks, Maine and Kevin, for the great lesson. Good to see you guys again. Jamie says thanks, guys. Awesome. Um, Thank Jay, look, they're awesome. great, great guests. Thanks for having them on. Um, Alan, thanks for the tutorial. So yeah, um, this was fantastic. I really do appreciate it. And again, it was see, it was so cool to like do a live session like on the courts. I really appreciate you all doing this again. And yeah, everybody yeah. definitely check out um, Kevin and Megan's content at TotalTennisDomination.org and also their YouTube channel um, by the same name, Total Tennis Domination. Um, check out the Alexis Pass link if you like. And yeah, I really appreciate it. And hopefully I'll See you all again soon. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. See you all. See everyone. Thanks for watching.